due process, winner of 25 regional Emmy Awards. Due process is a presentation of Rutgers University, Newark, and Rutgers Law School in Newark. What about the bed? Were we waiting on a detox bed? Um, I, I waved it, I said. Uh, oh, you can't wave it no, because no, then no, you no, can't no, be I'm finished with Judge Pratt. And Victoria Pratt is no ordinary judge. Good morning, please be seated. She runs a kind of court you have likely never seen before. Court becomes a place for assistance. The Newark Community Court, sometimes called the Social Work Court, on this edition of Due Process. Well, the criminal justice system is seriously flawed. That's no longer news. And neither is the urgency to do something about the plague of mass incarceration. The human cost, especially to the most damaged and vulnerable among us. I'm Sandra King, here fittingly in the Moot Courtroom at Rutgers Law School. Because on this edition of Due Process, we focus on the poor, the addicted, the confused and discarded who get caught in the wheel of minor crime and pointless punishment, and just maybe come one small step toward breaking that cycle. Your name for the record? James Martin. How you doing today? I'm good. How's the baby? She good. Good, good. How big is she now? She's about to be eight months. She can't eight open. months? Yeah. Oh. What's going on with Mr. Martin? James Martin is in compliance with the Whoa, I'm gonna have to give Mr. Martin a hand clap. It's a miracle, about time. It's a court that encourages audience participation when a defendant called that? client here has shown some signs of success. Mr. Martin, I'm writing excellent on your file. Can you believe that? <laughs> you have to laugh. Look at all the angry notes. Excellent. <laughs> Good stuff. I knew that guy lived inside of you. Head this way, fellas. Keep your eyes forward. Watch your time. But cross this kindly judge, fail to follow orders like kick the drugs or get a job. But Mr. Jones, who is your problem? And she'll scold you like your mother might. $100 from 2012. You got another, don't speak when I speak. That's why you don't know what's going on. No matter how old you are. Stop worrying your children. Don't be driving around late at night. I don't feel out late anymore, Your Honor. She will get right in your most private business. Uh -huh. How old was the girlfriend? Oh, you should see your daughter's face. Boy, she was not happy. 40? 30? <gasps> oh, my, oh, my goodness. Because this is Newark's community court, among the first in the country designed not to prosecute and punish. They're offering to help people, you know, as, as opposed to just sentencing people. But to break the cycle of arrest and trial, fines and jail for Newark's written off and wretched. The nonviolent offenders who do drugs and other petty crime who show up in Newark's municipal court again and again. But not by punishing them, by offering people appropriate help. We want to find out why is this person coming back before the court over and over? Is it related to substance abuse. So you're in the program because you have a drug problem and you haven't been dealing with it. Let's just get this, you don't get to waive detox. You don't get to waive getting into a treatment program. You do not get to because it's a part of your sentence. You don't get to waive it. Before I could go, I detox before. Put it out, That's, that doesn't make any sense. Stop trying to game the judge, no. And if you I think Judge waive. Pratt sounds like no, a scolding mom, you're not alone. And did you find her behavior toward you any different than normal judge? No, it's like my mother. Your mother was pretty tough. Yeah. He got to get off the street. That's what's wrong with these young people. And in this court, an actual distraught mother gets her too. I know if I catch him out there again, he's going to get a nice orange jumpsuit. Do you understand what happens if you don't come back to court, if I release you? Yeah. What happens? Tell me. Get locked up. All right. Do I, and you know I don't forget a face. She really has been a pioneer in administering what's called procedural justice. Uh, and this is the idea 
that people best respond to the law when they feel like they're being treated fairly by it. What do the young men in our community have to do? What do the young men in our community yeah. have, to, have to do? Yeah, what do they, they have, have to, to do? do? I think that they have to stand up and first of all and be men mm. and say, I'm not gonna follow the crowd. Part of what I think she seeks to do through her procedural justice lens is to restore legitimacy in the law where for a very long time in too many communities it hasn't existed. So Haygood's New Jersey Institute for Social Justice is just one of the court's community partners. The Newark Downtown District is another, providing some court clients with the chance for community service. And there are partners inside the courtroom too. Let me call this case back up for them. Because here, the prosecutor and the public defender are not your usual adversaries. And it's something that a traditional prosecutor will probably have a hard time adjusting to. Um, in my office, we do call it the social work court. You know, a lot of my colleagues uh, turn their nose up at uh, what we do or what I'm doing here. Um, and I, there is an element of social work uh, in it, but I, I don't think it's so much social work that the legal aspect is thrown out the window. He's suggesting a day. I, I, I know that's oh, a little... A day of, a, of what? A number of like days. Like he's coming back on another day? No, no, the it's, program, it's, three days. Yeah, he's, he's, he's requesting five. three days. So are you a believer? Does this work? Oh, it absolutely works. It absolutely works. How many days? You got any clean days? No. So what we got to do to get you clean, Ms. Perry? And I'm saying we, but I mean you. We are reducing the number of contacts with the justice system, and we're inserting help, social services, community services. Saving lives? I think we are. I'm going to have you talk to Ms. Tucker for a little bit just because, you know, you went through a little bit today. That was excellent, though. Come sign so your I'm, notice. I'm done, right, with the program and everything? No, you're not. Is he done? Yeah, I'm done. Oh, wait a minute. Give me some news. I'm happy to report that, Mr. Mayor. Are you sure? Oh. There are some miracles. There are some miracles. We'll take whatever we can to um, shift folks, whatever we can. You believe in this program? Absolutely. Absolutely. And the ever-optimistic Judge Pratt joins us to talk about those small miracles together with Professor Todd Clear of the School of Criminal Justice here at Rutgers University, Newark, and author of The Punishment Imperative. Welcome to you both. So we're looking here at an alternative to punishment? We are, we are. Having the New Jersey Judiciary partner with the Center for Court Innovation to create Newark Community Solutions has now allowed the court to have an alternative to sentencing defendants to jail who would otherwise get jail. So now you can, a judge can partner punishment with assistance and begin to look at the underlying cause for offending. So the assistance goes from what to what? The assistance goes from assistance to um, filling out paperwork so that you can qualify for Medicare or Medicaid, going back and getting you linked to a GED program, helping someone fill out a GED, um, GED application, job application as well. But what we really see are a lot of linkages to drug treatment. So we saw um, some of your colleagues in the court calling it a social work court. Um, Todd, is that a, a good thing? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, people complain about the criminal justice system being a revolving door. Well, this is the opposite of a revolving door. This is an attempt to uh, treat people uh, with the kinds of issues that bring them into the criminal justice system and resolve them so that you, that you don't see them again. And um, anyone who's spent a day in a courtroom uh, like Judge Pratt's has to understand that um, in, unless we are able and willing to approach the problems of the justice system in this way uh, by seeing people and their, their uh, uh, issues mm -hmm. as opportunities to make investments so that people can change, if we don't do that, we are going to have just nothing but a revolving door and a, and a very expensive one and one that's pretty frustrating because it doesn't do much. One of the things that you're working on is mass incarceration. What Judge Pratt is doing is in the municipal court. Is that the place to start? Uh, it's a great place to start. Uh, and I, I think you don't uh, address the problems of mass incarceration by only working on one issue. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the people who are in prison 
have had experiences in the municipal court. Many of them, that's where they started. Many people who leave prison end up in municipal court. If you don't um, use every criminal justice connection as an opportunity to do things about the problems that get people in trouble with the law in the first place, then you're, then you're going to see them again, uh, very high numbers of them again. So when they call you a social work court, is that a pejorative to you? I think that uh, people intend it to be, but I don't take it that way. Yeah. I think it's, it, when we send a drug addict to jail for 90 days, we know that on the 91st day the person is still a drug addict. So I'm considered upstream. So, okay, so that would be the normal criminal municipal court. You come in, you're an addict, you've violated the law, you're going to jail for 90 days, you're coming back out, you're in the same mess you were in. As opposed to in your court, what happens? In my court, it's a post-adjudication court. So even though they may plead guilty, they immediately begin to receive services. They go upstairs to the clinic, which is staffed with these incredible social workers, case managers, and individuals, professionals, who are used to dealing with these issues. They immediately do intake, so we begin to get information about them and their past, and begin to uh, sentence them to social service mandates and community service mandates that will help address those issues. So one of the things that, there were so many things that were interesting. <laughs> one of them was, that um, we saw the young man who, when I asked him what was different about you, he said, she's like my mother. <laughs> well, if that means that a person in authority cares about whether you succeed or fail, creates boundaries for you, and then raises the bar of expectation, then I guess I'm in good company with his mom. Dad, I saw lots of apparently damaged people, whether through drugs or alcohol or other problems. and. I wonder how much can be accomplished even with the love of Judge Pratt and the services upstairs. Well, in this business, nothing is 100% successful, right? So you don't have a magic bullet that if you just uh, uh, hit this button, you're going to get everything turned right again. And for many people who are in trouble with the law, it's repeated exposure to, to solutions and repeated exposure to services that makes a difference, not just one time. But that said, um, if you can go from uh, half the people coming back to prison within a year to a third of the people coming back to prison in a that's year. That's progress. That's, that is extraordinary progress and it's cost effective, not just in terms of the money that's saved, but the, victim, uh, the victims that, are, uh, that no longer have to be victims of crime, the amount of, the, uh, and, when, and when the public becomes safer from this kind of thing, you know, other stuff starts to flower, you know, industry flowers, uh, schools become easier places for people to succeed. So this is, uh, this doesn't have to be even close to 100% successful to be a really terrific idea and exactly the right public policy. You're working on some other things in Newark, different from what Judge Pratt is doing, more on the ground. How is that going and what's it that you're trying to do? So the problems that Newark has with public safety are very much concentrated in a small number of people who live here. Mm -hmm. And um, they see the court, they see the police, uh, they, 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 they are uh, uh, under the, the knowledge of the justice system. So for example, 4% of the population of Newark is involved in 60% of the shootings. 4%? 4%. 60% of, of the shootings. shootings. Uh, the average number of prior uh, criminal justice contacts of a person who is accused of a, of a homicide is nine. So these are people who are regularly in the criminal justice system. We know who they are. If we just uh, uh, think the criminal justice system by itself through the application of the law is going, to, is going to change the way this works, then we're not learning anything from literally 100 years of the way we've been doing this business. That's why something like this is so important to do because not only is it different and it will make a difference in the way we work, we can learn from, we can say this strategy got us better results than that strategy and we can start doing things that in the long run produce the kinds of changes people in Newark need to have to be able to make Newark the kind of place it needs so to be. So your analysis focuses on where the greatest problems are, where the greatest numbers of criminal offenses are, concentrates police activity in those places. And concentrates also social service activity in those places, concentrates public attention on those places. And it's not just police that are, uh, uh, that are the solution here. Now serious crime you have to have the law involved and the law has to be carried out and the, and the judge will say that you need the law needs to be respected and it needs to be a, a, a piece of this puzzle 
But by itself, the law doesn't change lives in the way that these kinds of other things do. And, and most people who are involved in the criminal justice, in fact, most people who are involved in these serious problems want to have another choice, and they simply don't have it. So, Judge, how much of what you see, because, again, these are people who've been in the system mm -hmm. to one extent or another, are caused by the fact that our reentry is so inadequate. So people come out, whether it's out of the jail or out of the prison, and they're back in the same environment, mm -hmm. they're back in the same lifestyle, and they're back to you. So what I'm seeing is that are, there are a lot of limitations for folks, obviously, when they get out of jail. So now they're back in their community and back in an environment with more limitations that they had before they went in, their ability to go to school, their ability to get work. So what's great about your Community Solutions and this initiative is that it holds the community accountable for re-entry as well. So we send them out to community providers who can assist them with things as well. We've done, and we've been really grateful for the work that Rutgers has been doing because Newark Community Solutions has done a lot of work and benefited from a lot of these re-entry programs, being able to refer people out to some of these programs. Again, I'm dealing with low-level offenders, but there are a lot of low-level offenders who come in who have violent records who we are able to make benefit from some of these programs that Rutgers is engaged with as and, well. And the people who cause, it seems to me, even more problems for the rest of us here in Newark are people who are not such low-level offenders, but they too will come out. Almost everybody who goes in, right, is going to come out. So what do we do to get the kind of services you're offering in municipal court, in a very special municipal court? How do we make that something that is a natural return to your community with all the services. Todd, is that something that's realistic? Because it doesn't seem to me that it's ever really worked. So it's, uh, real, it's, it's essential uh, and it's hard to do. Uh, so uh, about a thousand people a year come back to Newark from the state prison system. Uh, they're not, they don't all look alike. They're, they have different kinds of problems. They have different kinds of uh, needs. They have different, they're of different ages. They're different capacities. And unless you're in a position to to take the range of strategies that a group like a thousand people will require, you really can't be responsive. So one of the things that, uh, and, and you know, Newark mayors, uh, including the current mayor, have been very uh, focused on the problem of trying to create a place where the people who come back from prison can be, become uh, uh, useful and contributing citizens in the city. So it's not a, it's not a problem of at the leadership level, it's a problem at the delivery level, and we and we have to deliver those things that though that enable those people to make the right kinds of choices and stay. Open. But even when the will is there, and even when there are some programs set up to help people, there are still so many impediments. What do you do about those? Well, so uh, uh, for 30 years, well, really for 40 years, we've been adding to those impediments through the legal system. We've been acting as though if you make a person's life difficult, they'll find it easier to obey the law. It doesn't make any sense, but that has been. But the, that's the philosophy, that isn't been, it? That's it's governed the how we run right. Right. our entire criminal right. justice system. Uh, the idea has been that people just need more pain. And if they suffer more pain, they will behave better. Well, nobody does that in any meaningful way. What's happening now is that that nationally we're beginning to see the results of this failed experiment. For 40 years we've been doing this and it's gotten us where we are now and no one likes where we are now. So we're trying to find the way out of that mindset but also the way out of that policy set. Uh, in, the, in the state of New Jersey, slowly we are beginning to uh, peel off some of those impediments. I emphasize the word slowly, but we are. And uh, it's through uh, uh, joint efforts of public groups advocating and also uh, people who study these problems showing, out the, res showing the results. If we can make it so that the expectation is that people who leave prison can do well, then we will produce a diff an entirely different environment within which uh, the, the people who are returning back to their communities can, can expect themselves to succeed in those communities. So at this table, there's a recognition that the old system hasn't worked. But I wonder how many people who are watching us right now are saying, oh, they're just soft on crime. <laughs> And how do you answer them? Well, if they saw the clip, you can see that this is not soft on crime. This is actually smart on crime. People, when they understand the process, when you treat them with respect, comply. They come back to court. And that wasn't being seen in Newark 
prior to this idea of using procedural justice and explaining to defendants what was required of them and that they weren't just here for punishment, but they also had an obligation not just to the court, but to the community as well. So we've been fortunate enough that the New Jersey judiciary said, let us see what happens when we begin to use these alternative programs in these communities. So does that mean that we're going to see a community court in every city in New Jersey? We've not seen it yet. We've not seen it yet. Jersey City just got a grant yeah, for they one, did. so we are um, hopeful. We are hopeful, and there's definitely more interest. Judges wanting to do more in the court and providing alternatives to just sending individuals to jails or giving them fines that we know they can't pay. You know, so much of, of what controls not just the criminal justice system, but um, you know, life here in New Jersey takes place in the legislature where people don't want to be called soft on crime, don't want to be seen as helping the bad guys. How do you get through to them? Well, so we just, I think it's about evidence. Um, uh, we, have, we have been um, banging our heads against the punishment wall for four decades. And we know that it's expensive. We know that it, it uh, um, damages families, it damages communities, and it damages individuals. We also know from really a host of new research and growing research and a growing evidence base that a strategy that focuses on creating possibilities and, and strengthening people's capacities um, has much better results, much cheaper, much less crime. So, so I think that the, the idea with people who make the laws is for them to um, be responsible for understanding what we know about the consequences of those laws to be and, and, and then helping them to frame this in a way that the general public can understand why this is wise public policy. And yet things like stop and frisk, discredited, didn't work, um, targeted the most vulnerable communities. This country elected a president who says stop and frisk, more of it, get tougher, where is the connection between what's happening in the academy and in your very progressive court and the attitude that's out there and people who are in office being afraid to uh, go up against that? So, so the president-elect also campaigned on a torture platform. Sure did. He met one general, had one conversation in which that general said, look, torture yeah. doesn't work. And so I think this is the point. So people who are in the position of making policy are increasingly understanding that they need to look at the evidence of people who have studied the system and begin to make wise choices, smart choices based on evidence rather than simply gut feeling. And if you produce better outcomes, the stuff will follow. So you've written 13 books. I can't even begin to imagine how many uh, articles you've written, uh, journal pieces. Do you get, however, out of the academy so that you're listened to by the people who actually control what happens? So I spend m most of my time on projects that are uh, in the real world. Um, and uh, these days I'm spending a lot of my time on projects involving Newark public safety officials. We run uh, the Safer Newark Council out of Rutgers University of Newark, which is a collection of civic and public officials working together to pr produce a safer city. Um, must, much of my time is spent on education policy for people who have criminal justice records. So the answer you to that is yes. How many people taking your courses in, in, in the state of New Jersey? We have the, la the we have the largest prison-based college program in the in the state uh, here in New Jersey in the in the nation. Over 500 people taking courses. Their recidivism from rate Rutgers. from from Rutgers. Their recidivism rate is in, is less than five percent compared to about a 40% recidivism rate of the rest of the population. Almost all of them go back and, and can re-contribute to their communities. They do volunteer work. They are involved in civic engagement in their, in their communities. They want to give back. The idea, is, is if you actually invest in people who, are, who have um, made mistakes, caused problems, created harm, they can recognize that those were mistakes, problems, and harm, and they can start to do something about it. And they can become parts of the solution rather than parts of the problem. Judge Pratt, it sounds a lot like what you do. <laughs> and I'd like to talk about the community aspect, because what we know about folks who end up in court, we are sending them back into communities where their victims live, where their neighbors live. And so if we help them become more productive citizens, then we've also helped the victim. So this idea that this is soft on crime, if we, all we do is punish people who don't change their behavior and send them back, what have we done? What indeed. 
Our time, unfortunately, is up, but I hope we'll meet and talk about this again. With my thanks to Judge Victoria Pratt and Professor Todd Clear, that is it for this edition of Due Process. But please join us here next week and every week for more on the critical issues of law and justice, or stop by our website, where the entire Due Process archive is on demand, online, all the time. Till next time, for producer Tanya Bentley and all of us here, I'm Sandra King. Thanks for watching. There is a lack of legitimacy in the law and the relationship we've seen most recently between law enforcement and communities of color, between the way in which people of color are over-concentrated in our jails and our prisons. And I think what Judge Pratt seeks to do in her courtroom is to restore some of the legitimacy. I won't say that it's been lost, but that it hasn't yet been established. So she seeks to build a system of trust that when people appear before her, when they come to her courtroom, they feel like they've been treated fairly. This is part of her procedural justice uh, worldview. Want even more insight on law and justice? Become a fan of Due Process on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter and watch us on demand on YouTube.